So um, before I begin, let me introduce myself in a couple of words. Um, my name is Zohar El-Kayam. Uh, I'm a solutions architect for Aerospike in Israel. I come from Israel. And, uh, I've been to Poland for a couple of times. Um, so I'm really happy and uh, honored that you invited me to talk at your meetup. Uh, I've been working with Aerospike since 2018. Before that, I was a consultant working with Aerospike. And in general, my background is about I want to say 25 years of database experience from non, uh, from relational databases to non-relational databases, big data. Uh, I've been a consultant, I've been a developer, I've been a team leader. So I've been around, I've been a CTO of a consulting company. So I've been around for quite a while. Um, so let's go through the agenda and understand what we're going to talk about in the next about hour, I think, I guess something like that. Um, we're going to talk about Aerospike. I'm going to introduce Aerospike as a real-time data platform and uh, as a database, a multi-model database. Uh, we're going to talk the, about the secret sauce that Aerospike brings to the table, the hybrid memory architecture. And I'll give you a quick overview of our um, architecture in general, uh, just to get you familiar with the database and its unique features. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about developing with Aerospike and for architects and developers, what Aerospikes get you and gives the, what abilities it gives you. And I'm going to talk about the streaming connectors and specifically about the Elastic Search connector. Uh, I really wanted to showcase the Elastic uh, connector today. Um, I hope we'll get a chance to see the live demo. I prepared a couple of them. We'll, we'll do at least one. Um, one of the things that I'm usually known to be to do differently and um, i don't wait until the end for taking questions so if you do have a question just think free raise your hand send a message through the chat or just interrupt me in the middle um, and i'll be happy to answer questions as we go along so let's begin our journey and talking about aerospike by understanding the problem that aerospike comes to solve so the world as we live it in now has the right now problem. The, when we talk about real-time data and we talk about the ability to use data in real time, we, we technically speak about the ability to do things right now. So in that terms, we see that there are a lot of solutions out there, but some of them are, infra, some of them, the infrastructure isn't prepared for a real-time solution, or the processing isn't prepared for real-time solution. And if they are able to provide you the infrastructure and the processing parts, those parts become super, super expensive. So what Aerospike wants you to imagine, and actually provides it with some of our customers, and I'll show it in a second, is the ability to take the system, the data, the application, the mission critical systems, and deliver that information and that abilities for all of the reads and all of the writes, from the first read for the, to the billionth read, as you grow at millisecond scale. Um, and that is the ability to not be constrained by the technology itself. So the place that Aerospike shines, and I'll explain that in a minute even more, is that where technology gets you constrained, then Aerospike finds a solution for that. Now, it's not for all solutions. We're going to talk about where Aerospike shines and when not to use it, but that's the basic gist of things. So what does Aerospike provide in terms of technology? It provides the ability to start small and then grow to petabyte scales while keeping the performance very, very predictable and very, very fast. The fast in that regard would be the performance that you would expect from a caching system, but I would say that right here, right now, and you'll hear me say that a couple of times from in the, begin, in the, in the rest of my uh, presentation, Aerospike is not an in-memory database. The thing that we are going to talk about today does not getting, uh, but we're not getting those reads and writes from memory. And that allows us to give you the guarantee that the performance that you're going to get is the same performance from the first transaction to the billionth transaction. And we don't care about that. We give you the ability to do those things without being uh, dependent on being in memory. From the perspective of who uses us, then 
this slide shows mostly Israeli customers because this is the presentation we show to the Israeli crowd. But we have customers and from all over and all over technologies, and I will show that in a second. The idea at the end of the day is to capture those mission critical system where latency is important, where scale is important, where uptime is important, and provide that solution while reducing the cost and growing the business. So in terms of customers that you might know from uh, other areas and other areas of the world, we come. We started at the ad tech companies, uh, the ad tech firms, and uh, we can see big customers, big names like Criteo and the Trade Desk and Yahoo. And we can see customers from other technology, other verticals like financial, new tech, and you can like spot uh, some uh, really, really shiny um, customers like PayPal or Snap or Sony, PlayStation, and so on. So just zoom in on your favorite um, big name and know that the mission, mission critical system is running on Aerospike. Um, I'll, this is a slide just to so say uh, what are our, usually our competitors. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, you are going to get that deck and uh, those, the, the, the boxes that you see on screen are links to actual uh, docu documents that you can download and read about our benchmarks, comparing us to uh, various other solutions. So feel free to download them, read them, and ask questions. Most of them will give you the ability and will show you how to reproduce our benchmarks. It's, those are not like summaries, but actually guides to how to reproduce our benchmarks. Okay, so now that we're done with the uh, marketing stuff, let's talk about a little bit about what Aerospike is from the technology perspective, because again, I'm a solutions architect. This is what I do. So let's summarize Aerospike in, in a nutshell. Let's explain what Aerospike is just in a nutshell, just to understand where we're coming from. So Aerospike is a real data, real time data platform, um, but it, in its core, there's a database. And that database is what we would call a key access multimodal database, meaning we will be able to access records through various ways, but key is the king in that, in that scenario, in that situation. So it's a cluster database, which is designed for the high throughput, low latency scenarios, and works at any scale. As, and as you might have noticed, those are all buzzwords. So let's break them down into actual, like understandable stuff. So key access multimodal means that we are usually in the realms of things that are key access oriented, primary key access oriented, where you need to fetch a single record and some of you might have heard of key value databases or key value stores, document stores, um, and those kind of solutions. So that's the realm that we live in. That's the world that we live in. in our key access is super fast, and I'll explain why in a second. From the data perspective, we are multimodal. We can do a bunch of stuff. We can keep uh, multiple values for a single key. Those values can be scalars. They can be complex data types like GeoJSON or a hyperloglog, and they can be actual documents using our CDTs, our maps and list interfaces. But in general, if you think about the way that we take like take out objects and think about them, we are somewhat of a document store from the get go. The second thing that I wanted to describe is the fact that we are a dis distributed database. We are built to be distributed. We are built as a cluster from day one. So the cluster is multi-threaded, it's multi-cored, it's multi-node. The entire architecture is built around the fact that we try to parallelize uh, the heck out of things. We try to make things as parallel as possible, and that's a basic part of our solution. And I'll explain that when we talk about architecture in, in a few minutes. The fact that we want to parallelize everything is to be able to get to high throughputs. The throughput on Aerospike databases can be high as millions of operations per second per node, and that's something that is, that is very, very common. And while having high performance or high throughput is something that is usually can be kind of common with these kinds of solu solutions, we give you a predictable performance that will be in the sub one millisecond for the majority of the operation. Now, when I say the majority of the operation, 
I'm talking about the 99 percentile. So 99 percent of the operations, the reads and writes, should be in the sub one millisecond uh, latency uh, sphere when we're talking about key access oriented operations. And the cool thing about Aerospike is that because the way that this is built, we can actually do that from any scales. Users can start small gigabytes, uh, low number of terabytes, and then grow the solution as they go along, scale the cluster, and provide one solution for the small clusters and small data, uh, data sets, but also when it grows uh, to the higher, big, higher data sets without changing the technology. And that's a really cool thing. From our perspective, we say build it once and, and use it forever, scale it forever, which is not very common in our field if any of you already know about those kind of solutions. Uh, sorry, one, one question here. Uh, what is the operation in that, in that uh, context? Operation, uh, reads, writes, updates, um, everything to do with the key-oriented operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know that, for example, for billions of rows, uh, things like merge into can take uh, minutes on on big solutions. So, like having it under a second, it would be really, really amazing. So we're talking about uh, key accessing into specific records in sub one millisecond. So one mm -hmm. one over one thousand of a second. So think about things like, this is the latency that you usually get from a caching system where you put the data in memory. And this is technically what most of the people do. They build like real-time systems where they put the operational database on disk. And then in order to get better performance, they'll put a caching layer on top of that. So you might, some of them are native for that. Say Oracle and its buffer cache or MySQL and its cache. But some of them are external. You'll see Cassandra with memcache on top of it. So in, if you want to get like really good performance, most of the system build like two layer system. Yeah, sure. For Thank you. Operations, which is what I'm showing on, on screen right now. And what Aerospike does is take those two operational and caching layer environments and replace them with one solution where the data is persistent, is going to disk and being read to disk and being used from disk. But the latency that you're getting is a caching, caching speed. And we're doing that without putting the data in memory. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. OK. So th that's what Aerospike does, that Aerospike takes those two layers that are usually really complex to handle and really complex to, to manage and replace them in, with one solution, one cool solution that is basically a database. It's a, again, distributed database, and it knows to do a bunch of stuff, like uh, copying the data over to another database through a cross data center application mechanism. But that's a database. Then our customer came and said, that's a really cool solution that you have there. Maybe we can use that in order to interact with our legacy systems. Can you do that to interact with uh, things that we need to keep for non-real-time solutions, or let's say system of record kind of solution? So we did that. We actually provided solution to connect to the um, ecosystem itself, like streaming connection uh, connectors, which we'll talk about later this session. And but you also have brought the solution to use for a system of records where you need an archive and you need to keep data for long periods of time. And then customers come, came and say, "Ah, oh, that's really cool. Now we have real time data, but how do you consume it? How do you read it?" So we created more connectors. We created a connector for Spark, for machine learning, for AI, a connector for Presto to actually run Presto, Starburst, Trino, to actually query the data from the database in a language that everybody knows, like SQL. OK? So although we are no SQL database, we did provide some solution in our ecosystem to, to give the ability to people to use us as a holistic solution and not just a database, uh, which was the core of our solution from the get-go. On top of that, we also have solutions around the what we would call a strong consistency solutions. And we can talk more about that. But the really shiny, cool thing that we can do is create a stretch cluster across uh, regions, regions or, or like geographical regions. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, I leave it to that. If you have more questions about that, then we can talk about that maybe at some other time. I want to keep it on the really low technology level uh, as we go along. 
So at our core, we have a database. The database, we said, has multiple data models that we can uh, implement. Uh, the basic ones are key value and document, which most of our customers uh, already did and do on, a, like, on an everyday basis. But we also have solutions that customers implemented with their spike, like graph solutions or time series or SQL that I just mentioned. Because at our core, of the database, there are data services that provide those solutions, those database solutions, as part of something that is holistic and it's really, really not something that uh, the developers need to spend time in working on or creating for. Uh, the real-time data engine, the data distribution, and so on. We'll talk about it in a second. The storage engine is our secret sauce. The ability to keep the data in a hybrid memory architecture, which we'll talk about in a minute, is one of the biggest things that we have. It's the ability to keep the data on disk and provide latency and performance from disk without keeping any data in memory. Although we can keep some of the data or all of the data in memory, but that's like a second uh, architecture that we can provide to our customers. We also have a solution called AllFlash that doesn't keep any data in memory or any, not even the index in memory. In order to interact with that database, we created a bunch of smart clients where the application interacts, the SDKs, or actual APIs for JSON or REST API or SQL to interact with our database in a native way to the application. So we don't force you to go through some APIs. You can actually use the SDKs for that. And the cool thing about Aerospike is that we don't sell hardware. So we are really, really agnostic in terms of where you can run us. You can use cloud provider like AWS, GCP, Azure, or you can use your own bare metal on your on your um, uh, on-prem. You can use Kubernetes, but you don't have to. We are, we are fully compliant with Kubernetes. We have a Kubernetes operator. So in terms of where to use us, we are completely agnostic. From the streaming connector, from ingesting data, we have the streaming connectors, which we'll talk about later. And then on the other side, we'll have the, the where to consume the data. Uh, Starburst, Reno, Spark, uh, machine learning, and AI. And that will provide our customers a solution that is fully holistic around the entire, um, entire thing. So let's get a little bit more in depth and talk about the technology itself and the architecture itself, and start with the smart clients technology that I just mentioned. So one of the things that Aerospike provides as a solution is the ability to tell the client a way to actually figure out where the data is within the side of the cluster and provide a solution. The architecture from the cluster starts at the client. The client has some knowledge about the topology and where to find the records in the, cl in the, uh, in the cluster, but without keeping a track of every, each and every record in the database. The second layer for that will be the database itself, the real-time transaction engine where we will give you the ability, again, completely seamless to the application for getting data, for, for copying the data between nodes, and I'll show a couple of examples in a second. The third layer for that will be the data distribution engine where we actually distribute data across multiple nodes in the cluster without the application involvement, meaning the data will be fully um, balance between the cluster nodes, and there will, won't be any hotspots for that. Now, some of you might think, what happens if you now need to change the cluster, if you need to add a node, if you need to, re to a node uh, accidentally had an issue and needed to be replaced? So the cluster management, is, for the most part, is things that happen inside of the cluster in seamless way to the uh, seamless ways to the operators. And the data rebalancing engines are things that are being uh, handled by the database itself. So I'll show that in a second. If you add a node, the cluster will automatically rebalance the data without the need to reshard or to rehash. So without the need to rehash or reshard your data, the data will become rebalanced um, in, after a while, after a few uh, minutes or, or basically a few minutes. The real secret source for the database lies in our storage engine. And the way that we handle data when we kept on disk. So the, good, the big thing that is different between Aerospike and other solutions is the 
way that we think about disk and the way that we think about how to get data in and out from disk. And that data and that concept is called hybrid memory architecture. And the core of that solution is treating solid state devices, SSDs and NDMEs, parallel devices, like they were DRAM memory. Now, that means that we don't need a file system. We actually use the raw devices, raw block devices, and we know how to handle objects on those raw devices independently. We know where to store them. We know how to reach them. We know how to create parallelization on those uh, disks because those were what the, those disks were supposed to do in the get-go. They were supposed to be highly parallelized and not being limited to uh, the operating system blocks. Now, once, once you do that, once you take, get rid of all the file system layers and the page caching layers and so on, and you only talk with the disk uh, specifically with the block interface, with the open NVMe interface, you get really, really super fast interaction with the disk itself without being limited to blocks that the operating system gives you. And that's really interesting because now if you have a small object, you can just fetch that small object from the disk without the need to read redundant data as well. On the other end, those disks, those uh, parallel disks, NVMEs and SSDs, solid state devices, suffer from a problem. If you write over and over on the same cell, those devices will eventually die out. So what Aerospike does to prevent that is use the data, write the data in an optimized way that will be non-disruptive and will be non-destructive to the data, to the disk itself. It will get the data to the disk and make sure that the data itself will not, uh, or overwriting the data again and again, will not overwrite the same cell again and again, thus creating disk that lives longer. Questions? There's one question that I would uh, like think that people would ask. Okay, so if you're not using, if everything is on the disk, what do you need memory for? And for that, there's a really simple solution. If we, well, answer basically. So if we keep the data on the disk and we, uh, and the blocks are not bound by a file system and operating file system, then, how do you know how to get to each of those records? And the answer is that we keep in memory a, an index, a pointers, pointer index that tells us for each of the objects in the database where to find it on disk, which device, what, what block, what offset, and what is the size of the object. And if we can find in memory the location of the object quickly enough, then we can fetch the data from the disk or update the data in that record really, really quickly. And the cool thing about that is that that disconnect the relationship between the amount of memory that you need because you have big data and the, and the memory itself, the memory needs them itself. So we need 64 bytes per object for in memory. And that gives us the ability to control terabytes of data without keeping terabytes of in memory data in memory for caching purposes. Now, for the most part, when I explain this part, people ask for an example. So I actually prepared an example. And this is one of our most uh, common use cases that people are using Aerospike for, the user profile. It's easy enough to understand. So let's say that we have a customer that has 700 million objects, profiles, user profiles. And each of them is about between one and two kilobytes. That means that we have about one terabyte of unique data in the database with the replication factor for durability, we have two terabytes of data. Now let's say that that customer needs to read about 400,000 reads per second and 100,000 writes per second, the update changes. And the latency expectation for those operations will be 99.9% .9 under one millisecond. Now for Usually, people that are looking at that kind of problem and that kind of what solution they can provide, they immediately go to in-memory databases. But with Aerospike, we were able to do this, to deploy that solution, and that is 1.75 terabyte of data, but only 83 gigabytes of 
DRAM cluster wide overall. So this is the cluster utilization in disk space. This is the amount of memory overall that was used for that solution. And that was deployed on six, six nodes. And while doing that, we were able to provide 400,000 reads per second and 100,000 writes per second with a latency of 99.9% .9 under one millisecond. Now, some of you might think to themselves, OK, so that probably was super expensive, right? And the answer, not so much. Uh, we used C5 ADs for extra large on AWS, less than 100 CPUs, less than 200 gigabytes DRAM to almost 2 terabytes of data cluster-wide, and 3.5 and gigabytes of NVMEs. That cost like $22,000 before uh, we talked about like um, uh, discounts and, and, and stuff like that. Now, this is an old setup. With a new setup, that can be even cheaper. Questions? Um, actually, I wonder if um, is there option to to install Aerospike uh, on on prem locally? Yes. And uh, is the SSD a requirement, or for example, if we have HDD, it will be just slower? So what we need are disks or medias devices that can work in parallel. So if you if you go back to the slide, if we, let's go back to the slide. This slide, the thing that Aerospike needs in order to work really, really fast is to keep the data in on disk and then access the disk in parallel um, very, very fast. So you can understand from that that if you're using Spindle, the disks like a um, real hard disk where there's just like a plate and like a needle that goes and finds the record, the needle can be at one place at all time. So it can be in multiple places at the same time. So the latency the, that that kind of devices are providing is usually way slower. So in terms of uh, the type of disk that we need, we need disks that we are able to connect, like read from them and write for to them in a parallel way. So SSDs, NVMEs, persistent memory, memory in general, all of those are places where we can keep the data uh, in order to, to provide high performance. Does it have to be on a cloud? No, it can be on on-prem. It can be whenever, wherever you want to run. We have customers that are running their own setup with their own disks. And we have customers that are using a variety of cloud providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just thinking if this is uh, just possible to have, for example, if you want to have a uh, setup a uh, VM for learning, for example, and you have only HDD. So is, if Aerospike will... But just performance-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, yeah. So uh, for testing environments, for Docker containers, for playing around on your own laptops, you don't have to use um, block devices. You can use files. Mm -hmm. But okay. performance-wise, when you use file, then you take into consideration all of these things. So, so testing, developing, uh, playing around with it, no problem. If you are going production with that, then you should be aware of the consequences of that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. OK. So we said we have like a bunch of ways to do that. You can put the data in memory. You can put the data on disk and then index in memory. You can like decide that you want to put everything on disk and then do multiple I.O. operations in order to get the data. So there's a bunch of ways to do uh, with Aerospike. The cool thing about Aerospike is that you can mix and match. You can have multiple of those. So you can run multiple. This is called namespace. And you can have multiple namespaces in the same cluster. Uh, and making sure that you get your application solution uh, and the data itself will fit there. Like you'll be in a place that you can keep the data where it needs to be. OK. Um, and again, I, I left a lot of slides here just to give you some overview of what and how things are working uh, in the back end, like under the hood. Uh, for example, the clients. I, I mentioned earlier that we have smart clients. So the way that the clients work is by actually knowing which shard is sitting on which node. We preemptively shard the data into a fixed number of shards called partitions. And then we, can you hear me? And touch something and everything was flashing for a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, good. yeah I was touching my job and everything like flashing for a second. So we divide the data into a uh, four, like like 4,000 shards, 
we divide the data. Uh, the application doesn't need to divide the data by itself. We will do that for you. But then the client, when the client will need to read data, it will know immediately to which node it needs to go in order to find that data. Because it will know which shard resides in which node. And from that perspective, that makes things really, really interesting because you no longer need a proxy or you no longer need a, like, a name server that will tell you where the data is. The client itself has a, the logic that tells you where to find the data immediately. And that shortens the time it takes for reading or writing data because you always work with where the data is. From efficiency perspective, reading the data with Aerospike is considered the complexity of big O of one. So really, really fast. There's no better than that. We're like, we don't care about the number of records that we have. The, and records that you have, we always do that in O of one, okay? From the sharding perspective, we know how to distribute the data better than the application. We don't rely on the application for choosing the correct sharding key or finding a way to balance the data or so, those kind of things. We know how to take that uh, thing that you call application, your keys, transform them into something that is deterministic, uniform, and have a very clear algorithm, and then distribute the data to all of the resources of the cluster. We'll evenly distribute the data across nodes. We will evenly distribute the data across devices in, this, in each of the nodes in order to get the effect of parallelism, to get parallelization of your interacting with the data. Once you'll have a really high parallelism, parallelization of the data or accessing of the data, you can understand why high throughput doesn't become a big problem. You can get to the data really, really fast, but only if the data is fully distributed in an evenly way. From reading and writing perspective, the clients are agnostic altogether to what's going on in the cluster itself. But from, on the back end, where the transaction engine comes in, then reads always going to the owning server, finding the location of the record in memory, and then just going to the disk to read it. That means that reading of the data is being done in an immediately consistent way, like immediately consistent. <coughs> we are not waiting for eventuality. There's no quorum read, there's no stale reads. If you write a record and then immediately after that read that, then that's something that you will always get the latest version of the record. From the right perspective, the database is in charge of doing their application to multiple servers. It will be the one that keeps your durability intact, making sure that your data is keep being preserved on multiple nodes, seamlessly to the application. The application doesn't need to know anything about the process that's happening in, in the backend. And that means that if you take those two things together, and you look at them as a holistic kind of thing, then we don't care about your workload. That could be read heavy or write heavy, it could be mixed workload. We don't really care about that because we control the transaction engine and we know how to make this thing very, very efficient and very, very performant. From the ops perspective and where people are actually saying, okay, so this is what you get, for the get from the day one, but what happens later? then we are shared nothing architecture and adding more node to the cluster will actually automatically rebalance the data um, by itself, seamlessly, automatically. We, a, a new node will introduce itself to the cluster and the node and the, as the cluster as a whole will assign work to that node. Data will be transferred into that node until the data will be again redistributed evenly across all of the resources that will be seamless to the application. The application will not need to change anything from its perspective in order to add a node to the cluster. Same goes where if a node fails. If a node fails, the cluster automatically, automatically uh, recognizes that situation, and then it will use its self-healing capabilities in order to redistribute the data again to achieve, again, replication factor of two or three in order to make sure that everything is intact and everything is protected. From DevOps perspective, that's a really easy task to do. There's no resharding, there's no rehashing, 
There's no manual labor that you need to do when you need to add a node to the cluster, other than like introducing the node to the other nodes and, and let it run, let it let it run by itself. Questions? Cool. The last nice thing that I wanted to mention before I go to the developer perspective, just to give you like the complete um, overview of the database uh, as a whole, is our cross data center application solution. So our cross data center repl application solution is the ability to create uh, interactions between multiple Aerospike databases that can be on whatever. It can be on different clouds, it can be in different regions, it can be private cloud and public cloud, and so on. It's the ability to create an active connection, active-active, active-passive, uh, downstream, and so on, and transfer data automatically, but asynchronously, between different by clusters. The streaming connectors that we are going to talk about in a few minutes is taking advantage of this kind of solution and using the same change data capture, CDC uh, abilities that the XDR have in order to interact between two Aerospec databases and gives that to interacting with non-Aerospec database like JMS, RabbitMQ, uh, so things like that, Kafka, uh, and Elasticsearch, which I'll showcase today. A few words about Aerospec for developers and architects, and I'll start from what we are not. So. I think most of the people in the data world uh, understand relational database, uh, RDBMSs, where they have tables and links and connections, and you think about table-centric schema, where you actually think about how to join things together. This has been my world for like 20 years. This is what I did for like 20 years as an Oracle expert. Um, what I what Aerospike does and what change is that Aerospike changes the way that we think about, or not Aerospike, just all um, uh, no, in the SQL, no SQL family, change the way that we think about the data as a record, from a record centric, from a table centric to record centric. Meaning we think about the data on a specific record. Since the record will be contiguously written to the disk and being read in a single I operation, then we think about how to keep data in a single record, so that will be fetched very, very fast without the need for joints. So if we take the example of the employees and the training that we saw before, then instead of thinking about what is related to what, we think of what is consistent of what. So we keep the data in a way that will be a very, very, um, let's say, um, compact and, and saved in the same place. So you don't need to do the join later. Okay, so that's the basic gist of like thinking about how data modeling with Aerospike works. And let's talk about how it looks from the develop, actual developer's perspective. So I mentioned earlier, the big thing about Aerospike, the big uh, building block is called namespace. That's a definition of where we keep our data. It's the equivalent for table space or database in other, in other solutions. That's the way to decide where we keep the data, on which devices, what's the application factor, and stuff like that. The second level of that will be the set. A set is the equivalent of a table, but the table in Aerospike isn't really a table. It's like a the records themselves are semi-structured. They are defined at the record level. The structure is defined on the record level. So it's not exactly the same as a table. We don't need to create the table beforehand that can be created on the fly. We don't need to decide on a schema that can be decided on the fly. That means that every record or every object or every row will have its own structure. And that structure could be based of bins. Bins are the equivalent of columns or uh, items in a JSON, but those will be strongly typed. They'll have integer, double, string, boolean, uh, the ability to keep GeoJSON, hyperloglog, log, log um, document, actual document with document API, data types like list and map. And that's the uh, way that we can keep the data. And the really cool thing about that is that we're language, uh, like programming language agnostic. So the way that we'll keep the data means that you can write the data in, let's say, Python, but then read it from Java, because we know how to, uh, we're not 
keeping it as a blob and serializing it through the language. We are actually keeping it in a native data type that is being trans like translatable between different programming languages. Questions? From the SDK perspective and the uh, interfaces that developers have, then we divide our work into two areas. One is the key access patterns, where you get a record or you batch read a record or you actually change records through asset transaction mechanism and single record asset transaction mechanism, change part of the record, all of the record, delete it, and so on, um, including things like multi-operation on the same record or uh, check and set um, 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 patterns or expiration with DTLs. Um, so that's one pattern that we or one area that we talk about. And the other one is things that are not very common from the perspective of key value stores. For example, um, API for documents or filtering and uh, expressions and the way to manipulate data on the server side through a language, not through a UDF. Having said that, we have a UDF. We have the ability to run user-defined functions. We have secondary indexes. We have a complex data types like hyper log log and hyper mean hash. And we have like a lot of uh, ecosystem integration to other solutions, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So there's a bunch of stuff around those areas that allows the database to be really interesting in terms that it really fits a lot of use cases. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that we fit all the use cases. If you're doing, let's say, columnar database or analytical stuff, then usually you won't, you won't find that with Aerospace. But if you are doing real-time systems and you are doing things that are related to the real-time and, and mission-critical systems, then Aerospace is a really good candidate and a really good solution for what you need. And that's one of the things that I, I encourage you to try out and play around with, because it is something that, for those use cases, is incredible. It's something really, really different than other solutions that you might have heard of, might have seen in other places. So how would a record would look like with Aerospike? And, and, and with that, we'll finish that part of our discussion. Uh, so we have the key, the key, the namespace, the set, and the user key. And then we have a bunch of simple scalar bins. As you can see, this ex look exactly like a document. So we have like a bunch of scalars, a name, an age. We have like simple list bins. List is like a sub document where you can append an item to that list. And then there's like the complex stuff like uh, cards, the um, um, credit card that have, you can have multiple list of credit cards where each credit card has multiple keys and sub keys and sub values. And then you can do stuff like increment the, increment the counter, which is inside the map, which is inside the list, which is inside the record. So actually doing some act regular uh, document store uh, solution and, and working around with that. Questions? Cool. Uh, the last part of my discussion will be talk talking a little bit about our streaming connectors and Aerospike Elasticsearch connectors and so on. Before I do that, I wanted to show you a, like a really short live demo of something that I prepared beforehand. I'm just not sure that I'm going to do the, and be able to show that other demo. So let me just squeeze this in. And this is a real-time database that is running right now. And uh, this database, I loaded 100 million objects, uh, which came up to about two terabytes of data. Um, I'm running about 45,000 reads per second and then 22,000 writes per second uh, with a latency of P99 of reads one millisecond, millisecond, one over 1,000 of a second, and then writes between one and two milliseconds at the P99.9. So the, the vast majority of operations that are opening happening on this database happening in sub one millisecond operation. And the cool thing about that is that for that 112 million objects, which take 21 terabyte of disk space and doing like 70,000 operations per second, I'm only using 13 gigabytes 
cluster wide. Not per node, cluster wide. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, are we good? Cool. Okay, let's talk a little bit about streaming connectors, and, and by that, um, I'll, I'll release you to your evenings. So, the way that we think we thought about Aerospec initially was by thinking about the database. But when we talk when we talk about the world that is surrounding the database, we want to be a team player. We want to be part of a bigger discussion where we are not just the database at the end of the line. We are also part of the ecosystem and data uh, pipeline uh, world. So in terms of that, there's a bunch of places that we can fit in, but the way that we are going to talk about today is about the streaming connectors and the ingestion of data. Uh, being able to put the database in a place where data that is flowing into the database is either consuming data from outside sources or producing data to outside sources is something that is really interesting and really, I won't say unique, but it is something that is not very common in the world of uh, Key, data, key access database or document databases. The new thing that we introduced last month, which is really, really cool, and this is what, one of the things that I wanted to show in this presentation, is the fact that we now have the Elasticsearch uh, connectivity, the ability to take data that is being written into the Aerospike database and then sent for indexing on Elasticsearch, making the connection between the data that is highly updatable like, let's say, uh, as an example, um, the inventory numbers for something, let's say inventory numbers, and then the ability to do elastic search for the searchable fields provides full text search uh, capabilities, not to Airspike, but to those two solutions as a whole. Okay, so the streaming connectors in general are streaming, uh, uh, a CDC based solution to ship data out of the database or generating data from uh, other places and producing them or consuming them by Aerospike. This is done using um, uh, an intermediate uh, process, application, small application pod, a Docker container that does that. But in terms of what the overall experience is that this is part of our solution and supported solution, obviously. Okay, so a little bit more about the uh, search capabilities that I mentioned earlier. So the ability to do the queries on the database is something that we had for a really long time. We have secondary indexes. We have the ability to do filter expressions. We have the ability to do uh, filters in, in general. But in terms of having a full text search, that wasn't the thing that we were interested in doing and we didn't produce. Uh, on the other hand, there are full text solutions or out there that are really interesting, but those are not really real time in terms of being updatable at a real time phase. So what Airspike provided starting last month is the ability to actually interact between Airspike, connect Airspike and Elasticsearch as a, a solution that is connected between them. A record that will be written into Airspike See, a record that will be uh, written into Aerospike will be, will be then downstream into another database, let's say Elasticsearch, and then will be indexed there. That will provide two best of breeds to work together. From one side is the real-time data platform for data that, which is highly updatable and really, really quick when you want to get uh, big sets of data which change very often. And then Elasticsearch is a search engine that allows you to find those kind, that kind of information based on text space uh, and things like that. Uh, might have you, some of you might know that having from Elasticsearch and highly updatable records is something that is causing the indexes uh, to need to be rebuilt, for example. So how that would look like from uh, the technical perspective? Uh, so someone will write data into the database, the application will enrich the data, uh, the database will know to ch capture that change and send it to the connector, and that will be indexed on the Elasticsearch. 
When the application itself will want to read the data, it will first go to Elasticsearch, find which record it needs to fetch from AirSpike, and then fetch those records from AirSpike and uh, bring them to the application. The connectivity or the connection for getting the real-time data alongside the data that is being already indexed in the uh, Elasticsearch cluster is something that makes that solution very appealing for real-time applications and real-time systems. Okay, so common use cases that we already recognize and some of our uh, beta customers have been using for, uh, e-commerce, uh, customer experience, um, personalization. Uh, the demo that I wanted to show is around e-commerce, but I'm, I think oh, we are kind of out of time, so um, maybe uh, in another time. Uh, and then machine learning model training, again, where the data is being updated very often, and then the search capabilities add on top of that. Um, for summary, again, I, I, I think I've said all of those things multiple times. And the idea to have low latency database on the other side is one of the things that makes that very, very appealing to customers who wanted to integrate that. Now, we have customers that integrated it uh, in, like by themselves in the past on hundreds of terabytes. And uh, what we brought to the table last month was the ability to do that seamlessly with a connector that is basically a black box for, the, for them and not something that they will need to create uh, themselves. Um, some other areas where we uh, have connectors and uh, it's not streaming connectors, the ability to connect with Spark. Uh, we've seen people do AI and machine learning. I saw that it's one of your topics for upcoming meetups, so that's really cool. Uh, Aerospike is often being used as a feature store, uh, which is also really, really cool. Um, and we, we see that all over uh, when people need to train their models and need to do like a bunch of stuff um, because the ability to have a consistent database, which is very, very fast, um, uh, exists with Aerospike in, inherently. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about and mention is the Aerospy Connect for SQL, um, Presto, Trino, and, and those kind of things. The ability to actually have an engine that knows how to create and parse SQL queries and then transfer them into a NoSQL database in order to fetch the data back. This is, a, again, a really cool solution. We uh, teamed up with uh, Starburst uh, for people who don't already have Trino or Presto. So this is really cool. So uh, shout out to the guys at uh, Starburst. And if it is something that is interesting to you, then we should probably discuss it and feel free to reach out to me uh, after um, this meetup and after this call. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, links here. Uh, some of them are for the Israeli crowd, like the our meetup, the Israeli Auspec user group, uh, which is supposed to have a meetup, meetup yet tomorrow, uh, but that was postponed like earlier today. Uh, but there's a bunch of other stuff that might, you might find interesting, our blog, our developer hub, which is really, really cool, um, and so on. Uh, just on time. It's like 9 p.m. sharp for me. So I will take some questions if you have any. Uh,